Uh, hello, I'm Justin Ross with Fluke Biomedical, and this is my uh, cohort today, Boyd Campbell with Southeastern Biomedical Associates. And I will probably break the computer at least once. That was really quick. <laughs> ah, there we go. Things we're going to cover today. We're going to cover is electrical safety testing still important in keeping patients and staff safe? We're going to talk about some changes in FPA 99 and discussion on alternative maintenance procedures. We're going to try to keep this as a bit of an open forum. There's going to be some interaction back and forth because one of the things here in the United States is there isn't a way to do things. There's multiple ways to get things done. And each hospital and facility has adopted different ways over the time. And this is a great place to start to have some of these discussions about what's working, maybe what's not working, and what's still relevant, where has time moved on through. So without further ado, Mr. Boyd. Okay. Well, and I think this, you know, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. You know, we're biomeds here by trade. You know, we know what the mac macro shock, micro shock, all this stuff is here. But I got just a bit of a trivia question. Where did the where did where did the basis of us doing electrical safety testing come from? Ralph Nader. Yeah. Ralph Nader. And where was it published? Ah. I know. Women's Day magazine. Women's Day magazine. Ralph Nader done an article many, many years ago. I think it was probably in the 60s, something like that, about the number of patient deaths that were attributed to microshock within the hospital. And because of that article, boom, we have the biomed field here now. So I don't know what you think about Ralph, but hey, Ralph is the one you can attribute to starting the biomed field here. Um, again, we're not going to go through all of this stuff, some of it here. You know, hey, we know what will kill you. We know what won't. What we're going to be looking at today is really mostly the standards. And we're going to try to keep this from happening right here. We don't like that one thing. So let's just roll on here to the next one. All right. So as everybody knows, safety is the key to everything here. I remember when I was interviewing for my very first position, a job. Nervouses can be right out of school. I got the job. But the facilities director called me back into his office. He said, you've done very well except for one thing. He said, you missed the most important question. He said, when I asked you, what do you do? You know, I give you know, the other typical biomed answer, you know, nervous, out of school, I, I fix stuff, I'm here to do this and whatever you tell me to do. He said, you did not say the word safety. And he called me back into his office just to let me know that after he had hired me here. All right, so. Electrical safety, we do it. It's been around for a long time here. What are we trying to do? We're trying to get rid of the shock hazards, trying to get rid of the potential of things that happen. Now, over the years, it has gotten much, much safer. I don't know how many of you in here are old enough to remember non-isolated inputs on devices. I do. Anybody else in here remember AC defibrillators? I saw a picture of one in an encyclopedia once. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I remember these things. So this was extremely important then. Now, is today, and we're going to talk about this, things have changed a lot. Things have inherently gotten a lot safer here. But we're going to talk about a little bit, you know, of, within the hospital environment, some of the things that we need to look at. We know we got to do the beds. We're going to talk a little bit about the patient care area here and some discussion on that. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the things that changed with ECG testing here. You know, it used to be that we were going off of the NFPA 99 2005 edition. Well, now we're up to the latest, greatest, 2012. And by the way, NFPA or uh, DNV, Joint Commission, and CMS all have adopted NFPA 99 2012 edition. So now we're not going to talk about the others. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that well, here in a little question. bit. How many people have adopted 2012 and who's on a different version? Or do you know? Wait a minute, how about this one? Do you know which version you're on? No. Okay, so okay. We, we have one person. What version are you on, sir? 12. 2012. Anyone on 05 or older? Okay. All right, takes care of that. All right. I will make one disclaimer here. Uh, 
Now, we're talking about this, and so we're talking about from the Joint Commission, DNV, CMS standpoint. You may have different um, municipalities, different standards for your state, for your county. Who, who here is from LA County? Really? <laughs> I knew I was going to get one. It used to be, and I don't know if this is still the case, but when a piece of medical equipment came into Los Angeles, it had to have the CLA marking on it, or it was not allowed in, County of Los Angeles. I don't know if that's still the case or not, but I know that used to be the case of things. So as we get through and we talk about this, we are talking about the main, what's going to get you through your inspections here and what, we're, what best practices are and what some of us are doing around and so we can get a little bit of information from our other folks here as well. So we talked about this and when we're looking at this, where in a hospital is this electrical safety important? You know, I have, here, have heard all kinds of great conversations in the last three years of doing this presentation. Some people have adopted these alternative maintenance and the science and reasoning behind it. And I keep going back to, Everybody understands how a hospital bed's unplugged, right? <laughs> Does anybody want to, want to just share that? About 50 miles an hour, right? They leave it plugged into the wall and they yank it away from the wall until the port cord removes itself. Or the vacuum cleaner. Or the vacuum cleaner. How many people have seen this? The vacuum cleaner's plugged in down there. You take the cord, you grab it, you get this nice little loop going, it goes and the outlet pops out. How many times do we see that? So, <laughs> Quick disconnect is what we refer to that as. I got to watch making jokes about this because my wife's a surgical technologist. And uh, when we first got together, I took away her tape privileges in the house. And so such jokes now just keep me beat. But <laughs> moving down, T-probes. T-probes has been a big discussion. We get lots of questions from our customers about how to test transesophageal probes. And, you know, is it done in central sterile? Is it done by the biomed? If it's done in central sterile, is it a pass fail? What kind of documentation? How do I test it? And a lot of people don't realize that a lot of safety analyzers right now, you can plug in adapters and actually get exact readings right from your, from your electrical safety analyzer. So where are other places in the hospital that you might have to do it? There's some devices that depending on where it sits in the hospital, it might have a different risk level, right? Have we, has anybody taken time to go through your risk levels and make sure that your equipment is falling in the appropriate risk level. Is anyone still using risk level assessment sheets? You know, what locations have kind of dried up a little bit? And we're gonna get into here in a few slides talking about what is a patient care area. What is a patient area? Where do you have to have more improved uh, standards? Was, I, was there anything else we're supposed to do in this one? I don't know, we'll see. We'll All get right. it if it is. Oh yeah, look at the little yellow blurb. What's that say? Yeah. All right. We know we're in a bad environment, guys. We can get in there. <laughs> Question for you here, uh, and this is kind of a hot one. How many of you do safety testing on all of your devices at least annually in here? Raise them up high. I'm, cur I'm curious. I just like to see. Okay. All right. So we're seeing about a fourth of the people, and that was what, what the standard called for. But now we have some leeway with when we're getting into our, our AEMs that we don't necessarily have to. And as we travel around, we see a lot of different practices in place. We see from places that are doing it on everything, you know, they're doing their defibs every six months. They're doing electrical safety on every device, at least annually. Then we walk into facilities and we'll see facilities that go through the ICU. Here's the, uh, the monitor hanging on the wall, and the inspection is still looks hanging good. on the wall. Let's move on to the next one. They have changed it to a visual inspection. Does it pass? As long as you can document and as long as you can prove that you don't have an issue with that, yes, it does. Now, I'm coming old school. That's a little bit taking it too far. That's personal opinion, voidology here, as I like to say. You know, I like to at least plug it up, make sure it's working like that. But when you get into the AEMs, and we'll talk about that later, um, you have to prove what you're doing when you vary from the standards that are out there. Hey, Boyd, how about patient-owned equipment? What, about, what, patient, if, what if the patient's bringing in a medical device? Should good I start checking that one? Yeah, how many of you are testing patient-owned equipment as it comes into the hospital? Is, How so many of you are having the nursing staff 
test it or look at it as it comes into the hospital. Okay, you know, one of the things we have to consider with this stuff, now nobody, Lord knows I've got those calls at 3 a.m. in the morning going, Miss Smith up in room 318 brought her CPAP. We need it safety tested. My first response to that is, will you tell Mrs. Smith? We'll see you at 8 a.m. I will be right there. I'm on my way. Um, Joint Commission or well, NFPA 99 does not 100% specifically say how you have to handle this. But when you start looking at it, does it fall within that environment of care? Yes, it does in the patient vicinity. The last thing that I looked at statistics says that about somewhere at 78% of hospitals still allow patients to bring their own equipment into the hospital. And typically it's a CPAP, quite honestly. Uh, now we have some facilities I've seen, they look at it, it's all plastic, you're good to go. Nursing staff can check off on it. We have some facilities that say, okay, nope, you're gonna have to wake him up, get him in here, so he can come in, take a look at this and go, crap, it's double insulated. Yes, we can do it, put a number on it and go. Of course, when you put a number on it, you never know when it leaves and your inventory's all screwed up, but we won't talk about that either here. Um, so How about this one? Does it have to be UL listed? Does your facility care? I mean, when you're buying new equipment, right? Who has a policy in their hospital that states that every device that comes in the hospital must be UL listed or higher? Ours State did. Of State of Oregon requires it. So what if your patient brings in a non-UL listed device? Are they allowed to bring it in? What we're seeing more and more, thank goodness, that the hospitals are saying, no, sorry, you can get one out of respiratory, we'll bring you a CPAP device to use. I think that is probably the safest thing right there, quite honestly. Again, but whatever you do with this, you better have a policy and procedure. And if your nursing staff is inspecting it, you better say, yes, they're doing it. There better be some way that they can check off and say that it's proven, been done. But the bad thing about this is, we can't prove the functionality of it. So that's why hospitals more and more and more are going to know we're not gonna allow them to bring in medical devices like this to be used. Plus the hospital can charge to rent the CPAP too while they're at it here. So that is something to think about. Like I said, in the standards, it don't give you a good clear, you must do this or must not do this but you better have a policy on whatever you are doing because once again, you are in that patient vicinity here. You are in that environment of care. Who's responsible for it? Every single one of us in this room. How about this one? We're taking care of incoming inspections. We got a brand new piece of equipment. What are we doing for the incoming inspection? Are we following that OEM procedure to a T? Anybody? How do you handle incoming inspections? There's a shady gray here because of some rules as I understand it pretty much state we should be following the OEM spec to a T when it comes in the first time, right? And then we can adopt an alternative maintenance program if we want, but how about after repair? Oh, yeah. OEM spec again? Here's a question for you. What if that OEM spec calls out 62353 for your electrical safety standard instead of NFPA 99? How are we handling that? Do you have an analyzer capable of doing 62353? Are we familiar with the terms of 62353? Because it's pretty much the same thing, it's just worded differently, but you, it's kind of a translation issue in all seriousness. Have we considered those? I mean, if you really follow the OEM spec, are we actually able to follow the OEM spec with the devices we have? Um, yeah, personally, I like to follow the spec, you know, 28 or 624. He's a Chicago fan, if you don't know, that's a song. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I was thinking hard about that one, Lloyd. <laughs> that I always have to come in with that joke. Pretty understand. Okay, um, let's scroll on here. All right, some of the things that we have to, have to, have to do. We don't have any exceptions on this. So um, OEMs have different standards than we do. We're not gonna worry about the design and validation. Yes, they have to do it. They have to do type testing. 
Now, when they're doing this, they're probably using IEC codes, IEC 60601, 60601-1 or dash two. Now, does everybody know all the standards of that? Do I? No, I don't. I will tell you, it is a little more prescriptive than NFPA 99. I don't have to follow it, so I'm not gonna worry about it. So we're not really gonna talk about those here, even though I think we got a slide on it here in a little bit. But you do get to uh, let some magic blue smoke out with those every now and again. What's that? You get to let some magic blue smoke out of the device with those. That's true. Some That's destructive true. testing. Some of the things they do. Yep. All right, so let's get down into it here a little bit. What is required for safety testing and look at our device? Incoming inspections. Incoming inspection has to be done. We have to have electrical safety test on that. How many people accept what the manufacturer comes in, writes down on a piece of paper and says, here it is? Probably a lot of people, quite honestly, if you think about it. You've got an x-ray room. Do you go up and you do the safety testing on that permanently fixed device or you just take what they say? Hopefully they've gotten it written down. That is acceptable. The manufacturer can do this. They can give you the documentation on it. They're held liable for it. But one of the things you want to make sure is, okay, when they come in, they install this laser, whatever it is, that they give you that documentation. More and more, a lot of places are doing, they bring in a laser, they're bringing it in for a case or something. You've got to do it yourself because more and more the OEMs are saying, nope, I'm just the guy that just brings it in here, rolls it in and helps with the surgery. Anything that's coming in for an incoming inspection has to have an electrical safety test on it before it can be used. Um, anything after service or repair has to have an electrical safety test on it before it can be used here. Now, routine testing in PM, we can talk about that when we get, we'll talk about the AEMs and using alternate methods here of doing some safety testing before it's over with. Let's see what we got. I got one more for you. It's a little bit of an offshoot on this. So I, I worked with the small ISO for 17 years before I joined the Fluke team. And I ran into the industry, most interesting conundrum with customers, the difference between warranty and service. You know, if you bought an example, a brand new anesthesia machine, they saw that it has a two year warranty on it. They assumed that two year warranty meant that the service was also included and performed. So when you're bringing it in, this in, is that actually doing a full service on it? Do you have the first look? What portion of that service are you responsible for? for and the tie in, is that electrical safety being done by the OEM service tech or is it being done by you? Because there's a lot of assumed liabilities, assumed things in there, but to actually spell it out and dig down into it, it might be an exception. So you might really want to look at that to make sure that you're actually following all those requirements. You know, we stole this slide. That's going to be the hospital, and I don't know what the HL stands for, quite honestly. We stole it from Jerry. Yeah. The person who's going to do Singapore. this wound up in Singapore, so... Hey, you got the second string showed up here. Okay. We're better looking now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I am. Um, but, okay, so. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, take that one out of the back. Okay. So now there are several different standards. And we here, you know, in the U.S., we fall under NFPA 99. That is where we go. Once again, the 2012 edition. Now, you could have your county, your state could say you have to adopt 2021 edition. Good news. There's no changes in chapter 10 between 2012 and 2021. So you are covered on that. So you don't have to worry about that here now. The manufacturers, they're going to use the IEC standards. Also the IEC standards are used overseas. Europe, they adopt those standards. You know, some of the, like one of the differences I can think of here is uh, like power cord resistance. You know, we're allowed a half an ohm here, 0.5, 500 milliohm. They have to either be 0.1 or 0.3 when it comes out. That's just one of the things I know here. But the IEC 60601 standards are like this. This is where they're doing the high pot testing on things. This is where they're trying to let the magic smoke out of it. They're doing everything. They're doing capacitance testing on it. Um, one of the things here too that used to be a requirement and 
praise the Lord, it's not anymore. You used to have to test devices that were basically double insulated for leakage current. And there is a method of doing it. You get out your rental trap, tinfoil. You wrap that device in tinfoil. You hook one lead to the foil. You hook the other lead. You're basically doing a point to point here to ground. And you were measuring what kind of leakage current was coming out of that. Now, what's funny here, you have a piece of metal. You got something in between it. You have another piece of metal here. What do we got? We got a capacitor. That's all we were measuring is really some type of capacitance that we were getting out of this. Thank goodness, the people said, uh, this just don't make any sense. There's not a chance of injury here. You know, even if my hot and my ground short together, the fuse didn't blow, the thing didn't, okay, it's just gonna let the magic smoke out till something burns up, but it's plastic. The patient is not gonna have to worry about anything. So they dropped that standard, thank goodness, here on things. I lost a six pack of beer on that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, how to do that test? Yeah, that didn't. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I and lost. I've seen yeah. people do it. And, but no, it is not required of us anymore here. Um, and we'll talk about some of the things. What is the next slide here? Let's see. The next slide. Okay. What is it? What, what it ain't? I'm from the South. What it ain't? Okay. Let's just talk a little bit about some He's of the, the stuff better here one. and what the standards are for NFPA 99. Now, I think we all know leakage current, 100, 500, 100 with it turned off, 500 with it turned off, well, with the ground closed, with the ground open. Now, are we required to do both of those tests or are we only required to do it with the ground open because that's going to give us our highest leakage current? Both. If you look at the standard, and I'm one of these two, I've done it for years. I walk up, I plug it into my safety analyzer, I turn it on, then I hit the leakage button, I get it, I unplug it, and I go on to the next one. Did I look and see what my leakage current was with the ground attached? No, I didn't. Why? Ah, we always get the highest current when the ground's open. But if you go back and you look at the standard, the standard says, you must test it with ground intact and with the ground open on this. And you've got two different limits on it here. Now we know our ground wire resistance has to be 0.5 ohms. We're good with that. Now, did you know there's a certain order you have to test in? According to the standard, you must do your ground wire resistance first before you do your leakage current test. And that is, you know, and it makes sense. You're trying to make sure that, yeah, I've got a good solid connection. I'm good there before I do anything else. All right, let's talk a little bit about how we get some of these readings here now. You go to your OR, you got a big video tower. You know, there's your video processor. You got a monitor sitting on top. You got a light source sitting in there. You may have an irrigation pump and who knows what else is in this tower here. All right. When we go to test these things, one of the things that we have to do, we have to make sure that we don't, we don't go and individually do leakage current on each of those devices. Why? Because that device is being used as a system. It's all one piece. So when we go, we first off, we do our ground. We have to do a ground to each individual device. I'm sorry guys, we have to open it up. We have to crawl back there with all the dust and the dirt. We have to go there, hook a probe to it, make sure each device meets our ground wire resistance thing. Then we go through and we test that cart as a whole unit, not individual, because we have to make sure leakage current is cumulative. So we got to make sure that when we're doing this, okay, we got 10 here, we got 20 here. Well, this one's 300, this one's 200. This, all of a sudden, and I have seen this many, many times, you walk in, you do it, you look, hook the card up, and well, we've got 583 million or microamps here. Does that pass? No. So then we got to decide, what do we got to do? You know, we got a device chart you know, with an issue, or do we put an isolation transformer or something like that on it? 
So you can't go in and test each individual leakage current. You have to do it as one whole device. I don't make the rules, but it makes sense. That's what NFPA 99 tells us we have to do here. All right, so let's talk a little bit about permanently fixed devices. How many people know the lead or the leakage limit for a permanently fixed device? A lot of people don't. With the ground lifted, and this is required on incoming inspection, initial installation, you are limited to 10 milliamps of leakage on that ground wire conductor. All right, once you do that, you're still held to the 0.5 for the ground wire resistance. Once you hook it up, according to NFPA 99, you're done. It can be there for 20 years. You're done. You checked it. You got it. Now, I have a little issue with that. Do things change over the years? Yes, they do. All right, you go and you test this device. And now I don't go in, I don't recommend going in, okay, let's pull the ground, let's do the leakage. I think we're good on that. Again, voidology here, this is just what I say. But I have found many times I will go back and I will test the ground wire resistance of my x-ray table back to an outlet or something like that. And I find all of a sudden, well, shoot, this thing's five ohms now. Well, yes, because somebody changed the outlet and they didn't do this. Somebody has worked with the plumbing. A lot of our stuff is grounded to the cold water pipe. It has changed. Maybe during installation, they used an aluminum wire going into a copper um, nut that fit down on this. When we, when we use different metals, they change over the years. So my recommendation is every year, go through and do a quick ground resistance of those devices in that room. X-ray is the number one place you know, that you think about for something like that. So go, hit it, hit it, hit it, a couple of places like that and get you a read. Make sure that that ground wire resistance is still good and intact. Again, is it required? No. Is it a good safety standard from my standpoint? I think so. For me, yeah. it was blanket warmers. I got lit up by a blanket warmer about 10 years ago. I came out of a sub-sterile, and uh, it was an older Gen 3 blanket warmer. Those ones, the stainless steel trays without the big orange heating mat underneath it. Well, the buildings vibrate. Did anybody know that? Like, the building will physically vibrate. So things that are under tension, like dog down into the panels, those screws can actually back out over time due to the vibrations of the hospital. So AC motors, like elevator banks, will actually vibrate the hospital. People walk and vibrate the hospital, and it's possible for those connections to loosen up over time. So I came out of a sub-sterile, working on a sterilizer in two wet hands. I stuck one on the blanket warmer and one on the scrub sink and picked myself up off the floor. It, it got me darn good. At that point in time, I'm like, this is, this is dumb. There's got to be a way for me to test this. And it's something that I didn't even know I could do with my safety analyzer. Like I carried around my safety analyzer for 15 years and never knew what point-to-point -point testing was. Does anybody know what point-to-point -point testing is? We all know that we can plug it in and get a ground wire resistance, but a lot of analyzers will have on it where you can take two leads, go to the ground point of the device and go to the ground reference in an OR or any room and measure the resistance between those two points. So where can you find those ground points at? You know, on the outlet, the screw that holds the outlet plate on is a ground reference point, especially the stainless steel outlets. That's a ground reference point. So you go to the one that's closest to your device and you measure between those two pieces. It, hits, it would have saved me a really numb arm for about four hours. But after that point, we figured it out and it's something we adopted. All of our blanket warmers, we started testing them every year. Because a lot of times, you know, we can't unload that thing and pull it away from the wall and get to the back side of it. Um, the other one I got hit with really hard was a cryostat. You know, for, you know, it really chills the skin tissue and it does the slices. I thought the glass, I thought that all glass was a, an insulator, except for those because they have a heated element in it. And I stuck a very wet hand on one of those and got a numb hand and figured out, <laughs> whoa, look at that. 
So we started actually taping foil to the cryostat lids to to get the transient voltages off of it because if I got hit, I didn't want somebody else to get hit and he'd come back on me. Just just two examples, but things I never I went through through school school on it, all kinds of factory training, and never knew how easy it was to do point to point testing, uh, which is a good lead-in yeah. to well, in just a minute. Oh, he's done, man. Come on. Um, just tell the laboratory that you want to turn off their chemical analyzer that they spent hours making sure all their reagents were perfect. And you're going to tell them that they have to turn it down and do a safety check. Uh uh. You're going to be point to point. Uh, In a hurry. Uh, or, you know, the other side of it is a lot of people don't check it. For some reason, a lot of I've seen a lot of biomed shops say that that's not part of the responsibility, is the lab. Everything over here is a responsibility. In that lab, they're calling it permanently installed devices, and they will walk away from it in a hurry. Okay, well, that does bring up one. I'll lead into this one. Who knows what the standard calls for for safety testing in the lab? It doesn't. There is not a standard for safety testing in the laboratory. There is no, says you have to do it so often, to get leakages or anything of that nature. Now, one thing, the only thing that is out there, AAMI, Amy put out a guidance paper, it's been three, four years ago, and their recommendation was, yeah, you should do it, and the limit that we recommend is 3,500 microamps, 3.5 milliamps on those devices. That's enough to hurt. But if you want to, you can go through and just look at it, and if it looks good, you're all right. Lab has a totally different standard. Now, is there something within CLIA or one of the other standards that has something that you have to do? You might want to check. You might want to check with your local state or your fire department, whoever comes through. Again, there could be different standards. Um, talking about different standards here, um, one of the things, and uh, you mentioned back there in Oregon, uh, UL listed, all your devices do. Is your safety analyzer UL listed as well? Something to think about. Uh, not all safety analyzers out there are UL listed. There is an obscure law on the books in the state of North Carolina that says all testing devices must be UL listed. Now, is it enforced? No, quite honestly but it is a law on the books out there. So that's something that you may consider here. If your devices say we have to be, you know, your medical device has to be UL listed, has to have CSA, something on it, you darn well ought to make sure that your safety analyzer has at least that same standard on it as well when you're looking at it. Okay, now that I've chased that one for just a minute. Leads, when we're doing lead leakage, how many do lead isolation on your monitors? good we don't have to do that stuff anymore Sold. here lead isolation that was gone that was a 2005 standard that we no longer have to sit there and put 120 volts on our leads and i don't know how many people you know, sit there and I've, I've, I've seen it what do you say i've seen it you know where you're sitting there and you got your hand on the safety analyzer and you hit the isolation button here and that hand moves real quick I'm just saying i've seen it before um Lead isolation is no longer required. Lead to lead leakage is no longer required. Individual lead to ground, no longer required. The only thing that's required for lead leakage is all of them to ground. That's it. So all your leads tied together to ground. That's it. So we don't have to do this. And this is one of the things, and I read the guidance article that came out, from uh, NFPA 99, where they actually said, you know, this is not adding anything to what we're doing. This is not helping. So why do it? I love it when I see things like that, especially now. And yeah, I, okay, find me a ECG lead that's non isolated anymore with an input to it. They know. So they figured this out. So those are a couple of things that have changed since then. Um, all right, one other thing I want to talk about here, uh, power cords. We've all replaced power cords. Do you know there is a standard for how you repair a power cord? 
Okay, when you repair a power cord, first off, if it's stranded wire, and it should be stranded wire that you are using, and this used to be something we did back in the 80s when uh, Justin used to do it back then. Back in the 80s, we I would take too. a power cord, we'd strip too. that thing down. What was the first thing we'd do? We'd grab the soldering iron, we'd put a little bit of solder on that thing, and we'd do what we call tinning. We would tin that. Anybody ever done that before on power cords? Okay, at least somebody's in here. Man, don't make me be the only one. You know, hey, it looked cool, all that. No, you cannot tin a power cord. That is not in there. After you repair a power cord, you put a plug on, do you realize that you are required to test the polarity of that power cord before you use it? What do we do? Hey, we get it, we hook it up, we do the leakage, we're gone. No, you have to test the polarity of that power cord before you use it. One other thing about power cords, if it's a life safety device, it has to be permanently affixed somehow to that device. Detachable cords can't work unless it's got something to hold that in there. So if you go up and you accidentally, or you take this part or you see a ventilator that they've got the detachable power cords, they make them for it, but they'll have a cover or something that's screwed on over it. If you see that and that cover is gone, pull it out of service, fix it. That is illegal. I'll call it illegal here. Cannot have detachable power cords on any life safety device. That means your defib, that means your ventilators, things of that nature. Personally, I don't want you know, the housekeeping person coming in here and hitting this and pulling the plug on me. That's what I got family for. Okay, uh, let's see, I think I got all the stuff on that part. Okay, isolated power systems. This is always a good one to me. How are you guys testing your equipment in the OR? Somebody talk to me. Do you just walk up, plug your safety analyzer into the outlet, you go through the room and you get your readings? Anybody do that? If you do, you just ain't admitting it. Okay, so how are you testing all the devices within your OR suite that are on isolated power? What do you do? Back there, Boyd. Got one. Oh, where? I didn't see it. Okay, so you're pulling it out of the environment. Anything in those ORs, they have to be tested on non-isolated power. Is it a pain in the butt? Yes. You know, because we either have to do, well, there's two things we can do. I'll give you the real way and the unsafe way. You know, we either have to take an extension cord with us, find a normally powered outlet, bring that in and test everything. You know, if you're going through and you've got it on isolated power, you're noticing all of your leakage currents, everything's 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.1, you don't have much of anything, sorry, that does not pass. Those devices, and they say could roll or be anywhere in through the hospital, also they say that your isolated power system could fail, all of a sudden you're on normal power, voila, you've got to test it on normal power. Um, they're, um, you want me to tell you the unsafe way that I used to cheat? <laughs> I had a power plug. Yeah, everybody turn the recording off here. I had a power plug and I went in and I shorted the ground and the neutral together and I had a big old red string on this thing and I would walk in and I would plug it into one of the outlets. All of a sudden I got normal power so I would go around and do it like that. Yeah, sh quit shaking your head. Um, so that ain't the recommended way. But just saying, anything within the OR has to be tested on normal power. Normally what you see, people are either dragging stuff out of the rooms or you drag an extension cord in the room. Okay, extension cord. Who knows the rules on extension cords? Can we use them? I'm hearing a lot. <laughs> yes. We can use extension cords like power strips, but you're going to have to inventory that thing. 
you are going to have to test it periodically and you have got to assure that it is not being used at more than 75% of its capacity. Now, I, I won't mention a company. There is a company out there. They have developed a power strip that when it reaches 75% of 15 amps, an alarm goes off, a little alarm and a light. I thought, how smart. Um, if you, uh, I think it's Leviton. I can't remember for certain here. Uh, has anybody seen those? Yeah. Is it Leviton that makes that? AIV. Okay, AIV carries it. Okay, um, that is a great idea. I thought, man, I wish I would have invented that. So that allows you now to use that. Now I will say, if you're going to use some type of a power strip, something like that, mount it somewhere on the wall, mount it on the machine, somewhere that you know it ain't just rolling around and winding up going wherever it is. But yes, we do have the ability to use them. Got to be tested periodically, cannot exceed 75% of the load on it. So you got that there. Uh, that is up to your state or uh, other local municipalities. There's nothing in NFPA 99 that says it should be. Now, best practice, I think it should be. Okay. And I will tell you, uh, just because it says UL on the power cord, that does not mean the device is UL listed. Yeah, it's you at least. Yeah, it's right here on the power cord. Yeah. So, um, and by the way, you know, if you've never replaced power cords in the OR, you know, look up the different types like SJO and things like that that are suitable for there. Don't just go grab anything that was a freebie for you. Look what you're supposed to use that are oil and water and all this resistance. That was a freebie. I ain't charging you extra on that one. Okay. I got this one. So we, we already hit point to point testing. We talked about it a little bit. What I wanted to bring up with this is though, when a lot of people go to use point to point testing, they quickly realize that their uh, three foot power, the three foot cord on their analyzer isn't long enough. So something that Fluke does is we do offer a 50 to 75 foot test lead on these. Um, I used to like to play OR rodeo with mine. So you know, when you wheel enough devices in the OR where it starts to set off the limb monitor, one of the neat tricks you can do with your safety analyzer is you take the 75 foot lead and you go to the ground plug on the limb monitor, turn on every device, and then go to the back of the different devices and get the individual leakage and total them up to make sure you're underneath 150 milliamps. And that's how we stopped having to go through and just arbitrarily plug things in and out. Uh, but there are these additional leads. Uh, the people in radiology, your, uh, any of those tables, x-ray tables, rad fluoro tables, CTs, all those, all those tables you have a patient on should be checked once a year. One other thing I'll mention here, and I would, Try very hard not to make this a sales pitch, but you know, I know the Fluke product here. Uh, testing of 220 volt devices that come up yesterday uh, in a conversation and the, the conversation was, nope, only thing you can do is just go and take your multimeter and make sure the ground is good. No, um, like the Fluke safety analyzers, they will do 110 or 220 volt um, inputs, outputs, just got to get a little connector and stuff from them here. We have a so, connector for it. The only thing it's going to do is when you plug it in, if you have a 115 volt unit, you plug it into a 220 volt outlet, it's going to yell at you and say it's the wrong voltage. Mm -hmm. Push OK and keep going. Yeah. It's just, it's part of the program. And just one thing while this showed up, I'm just kind of curious. So I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit. Uh, talking about leads, how many of y'all used your safety analyzer as a simulator when you're out for ECG? One, two. So just a few people. I was just curious. I was just curious on that. Okay. We're down to about 15 minutes. All right. Alternative hey, maintenance yeah. testing. You want me to go or are you good? Oh, well, I, I think we beat this one up pretty good already. Yeah. The only thing is, if you're doing AEMs, make sure you document what you're doing and why you're doing it. You know, that you've went out, you've got history on this, on this particular device. We've seen we've not had any safety test, whatever, in the last eight years, five years, like that. Or... And what I see some people do, they'll say, okay, we're going to cut back or we're going to do a sampling. Whatever you're doing, 
document a procedure for it. And then make that's sure all, you follow that's your That's all procedure. they ask and be able to stand behind it, be able to show the proof behind that. You can't just write a procedure and say, ah, we're going to do 10% of it and that's it. You can't do that. You got to say, this is why, and then be able to show the empirical data of this is what has happened. And if you're doing the sampling and then all of a sudden you see 90% failure rates, okay, this is why we went back to this or whatever. So um, a lot of us in here doing AEMs, you know, some of the manufacturer uh, PMs are just plum ridiculous. Now, I'm not gonna take an IV pump or a suction pump and it calls for a 12 hour PM. Did they ever look at the procedure for a vacuum you know, the vacuum outlets on the wall for the intermediate vacuum regulators. Those old Baxter ones, I think it was like a two and a half hour procedure to do a single vacuum regulator. You um, I, will, me up. I, I will give you a hot topic for joint commission and inspectors here lately. Um, again, a freebie here. Is your portable battery operated suctions, they are asking, how do you test how long it runs on that battery and to show proof of it? I've seen that now in three or four facilities. And they go, well, yeah, we just turned it on and it ran. Well, yeah, that's fine. How do you know it ran for four hours like the manufacturer says? Just to let you know, that seems to be a little hot topic right now that's going through and a little gotcha for people. FYI. All right, here's gonna be an open discussion one. What is a patient care of Sandy in space? This is another slide that we stole from one of our other presenters. So we know that there's more testing that needs to be done in this patient care area. And it's a six foot radius around where the patient's at. And the point of it was, is in this patient room, in this six foot radius, this is the patient care area. And I said, this is a really cool idea, but are all of your patients completely isolated at all times? Do they get up and move? Uh-huh. How do you document whether it's runs for four hours? Say for instance, you have ten of them. Mm -hmm. Would it be could you do like a like just test the three of them and document it? You like really run for four hours and say that based on your you got the like ten percent. What they are asking for is every single one. So it is a pain in the butt, just to be honest with you. Make sure you put it in somebody else's break room to run so you don't have to listen yeah, to it. Yeah, send it at your neighbor's <laughs> desk. Yes. <laughs> what they're going off of is the manufacturer recommendation. Right. And the reason they're doing this, they're saying, okay, this is a life safety. Yeah, we go in, it's a suction. There's 30 of them in the hospital and in the same room, you know, almost, same floor. The purpose of that is to get the choking food out of there. I yeah, yeah. You can't get up. I mean, I actually was involved as a witness of a lawsuit over a pump that the patient died because they couldn't get the feet up. And, and a new battery operated once allowed it to make sure that it's as really important. We test them all the time in the dialysis center in the Northwest. It's a very important tool to save people's lives. But the purpose of it is to get the feet out of the throat. They don't need four hours. Right? Yeah, I agree completely. You know, okay. I've sat here, I've swallowed something the wrong way and I got some spit down there and they, okay, that's about all it takes to do it. But I'm just telling you, this is something that's been happening and we've seen it. So it's it's been talked about, it's a gotcha. Every year they have to try to find a little something, just be aware. Most of the new ones have a, have a level that's showing you how, how charged up it is. So if you run up to 10 minutes and it just comes down to 75%, at least you know it's going to that might be a good way to, to answer that question. Exactly. Might be a good way to answer that question. All right, back to our patient space. So here's the definition of the patient space. Everybody can read it. But when I started looking at this, I started wondering things like, is my patient completely immobile at all times? Will your patient get out of the bed? So in this picture, I saw things like a sink. Well, is this room now a wet location because there's a sink and a drain, right? Something to think about. And so they're saying that like this computer here is outside of that six and a half foot area, or maybe it's a television, but what the patient gets out to change the channel, is that now in the patient contact? How about this computer over here, the computer on wheels? 
I don't have a clue what this is. I think it's a floating microwave. You know, the IV pumps, them coming in and out, the computers on the wall. My point of this is, is what is your area and how are you defining it? And how does it really come back into your regulations and being questioned if your patient's moving or can get to it? Does that space move? Yep. Just a point, something to think about. I'm not telling you the right way or the wrong way because I don't really know. What if you have more than five leads? Can you test all of your leads at once? So we had a really neat video for this, but we're pretty much out of time. So know that we there are abilities to use things like this neat little adapter to test all 10 leads of a 12 lead ECG system. That only took me five years to understand. All at one time. Yep. We can bring it well, back in. Well, Another thing you can do here okay. is this is on a defibrillator, Life Pack 20. So I have all the ECG leads here into the block, and then I used an adapter for my hands-free right to the other two ports into the top of it, and then I still have additional ports. So actually one of the neat things to do with our analyzers is I can hook up to 50 leads at one time with, with our safety analyzers. So if you have EMGs or all those old EEGs, you can do almost all the leads. One thing reminded me here too, you got a defib set in here. All of the devices that's going to be used in that intensive care area that could, could potentially be connected to the patient during a defibrillation has to have defibrillator proof little symbol on it. You will see it on the back. It's basically a set of paddles on the back of it that says this is defib proof, especially your monitors, things of that nature. That's something I didn't know for many years that's there. So that is something that you should look for. We had another little video here, but we're gonna, again, we're right out of time and I don't wanna get beat up for you guys not getting lunch. But I wanted to touch on this real quick, testing ultrasound transducers. So there's a few versions of ultrasound transducer testers. Ours is the ULT-800. Um, there's a few ways of testing all of your probes. The one way that we all know is we can connect our ultrasound into our safety analyzer, we go up, wrap aluminum foil around the ultrasound probe, bring it back into the safety analyzer and test leads that way. The problem with this is you always have to go find your ultrasound to do it. And if that ultrasound's in cases, so if you're bringing probes in and out, can you test that probe by itself? So here's a graphical representation. If you swing by the booth today, we can actually show you this. You can actually take a saline bath, a conductive bath. Um, I prefer using 0.09% saline. This is our ULT-800. So this bath and these probes and this adapter are part of the ULT-800 kit but you can connect those right to your safety analyzer and do that applied parts test, send 120 volts backwards through here into your saline. As long as your probe is submerged in the saline, it'll be conductive. And they measure the voltage coming back out through the adapter and back to the analyzer. It's a really quick way to burn through all your ultrasound probes in a hurry without having to go track down multiple ultrasounds. Yeah. And I think, just I think you may have done, I think uh, if you go to the Fluke training site, and it works with any safety analyzer, but um, you know, Go out there, it tells you how to do that. It'll show you step by step. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we have a few really good videos. There's another one we have posted on YouTube for how to pull that off. Yeah. So how could workflow automation save you time and gain usable data? So one of the things we've been bringing up a lot is this workflow automation. You know, when I went through school in the early 2000s, every technician was responsible for about 800 to 900 pieces of equipment. I've heard now some of you folks have up to two to 3,000 pieces of equipment that each of you are responsible for. How can you possibly get through all these electrical safeties? I hear a lot of arguments where people say, we just simply can't do electrical safety anymore and all these things, and we're dropping them out. I've walked into shops with 30 technicians and they have one safety analyzer. I've walked into shops where each and every technician still does each and every required test by the book, and it's all over the place. But one of the things that we can start to do now is start to automate these things. So another conversation we have with some large OEMs is their technicians are so focused on doing the repair work that honestly, they only do electrical safety a few times a year and they might not remember how to even set up the test. So one of the neat things about automation is we can gather all that data and bring it all into one system for you so that we can do things like have pictures of how to set up the analyzer and how exactly, remember that foil test? Did anybody ever remember how to do that? Well, here's an exact picture of how to set it up and then take over the analyzer and record the exact data. So you're no longer going through and pushing the buttons. That also allows you to do things like gather additional data that we haven't had time for 
for quite a while. Like, wouldn't it be kind of nice to know what the wall voltage is? Back to isolated power supply, you know, when you have those isolated power supplies, you should have a balanced load. Hot to neutral should be 60 volts, neutral to ground should be 60 volts, hot to ground should be 60 volts, I'm sorry. And between the two, you have 120. But again, when we unplug medical devices at 80 miles an hour in the OR, OR is under positive pressure, right? Every time you take a linen and they shake the linen out, put the new linen on the table after the patient and open up, all that lint becomes airborne. Because it's under positive pressure, it gets forced into the wall outlets. And your wall outlets will build up lint over time. If you ever want to see a fun experiment, go into the OR and take off one of those wall plates. You'll really be amazed at what's crammed into there. The problem is, is as you're unplugging things at 80 miles an hour, it can spark and arc out. When it arcs out, it's gonna burn that little bit of lint and cause a carbon buildup. And over time, you start to unbalance that load in the OR. So instead of seeing 60-60, you might start to see 75-35. A lot of times we won't catch it because we're no longer doing that wall outlet voltage testing. It's no longer in our realm. It might sit in maintenance's realm or it might be altogether gone. So who is actually testing your limb monitor and your isolated power supplies? The reason this comes down to is because nobody cares usually unless you either have an inspector there or the limb monitor is going off and they're yelling at you because the equipment you're responsible for is now bothering me because it's making this limb monitor go off. Where we could be recording this automatically through an automation software. So every time you plug into it, it's gonna record the wall voltage for you. Simply set up some limits on it. So when it gets out near those outside limits, it gives you a stop gap on your worker and go, oh, hey, this is out. Now you can go to maintenance and say, hey, listen, guys, I was up there doing testing today, and I just happened to notice the wall outlet voltage is getting a little unbalanced. So can we go up there and maybe uh, work on that system a little bit before we have an issue? The beautiful thing about automation is it captures it for you, and you don't have to do extra tests. And you're it's just pulling it in. And your techs are doing everything the same way. We talked about, you yep. know, hey, do you know you're supposed to do the ground first? Do you know you're supposed to do it off? Then I'll, you set it in there. Done. Everybody's doing it the same way now, which is kind of nice that you can prove on these automation systems. 